Okay, welcome to part two of the perils of pleasure. Uh, today we're going to look at maladaptive thinking. Uh, actually, they called it maladaptive day drinking. I mean, not day drinking, daydreaming. <laughs> so, um, of course, day drinking is also maladaptive, but uh, it's ways of adapting to uh, the stresses of your life that are unhelpful. And uh, hopefully, we'll actually get into a little study on the biblical uses of the word hedonism. So by way of review, uh, we want to magnify the Lord and exalt his name together. We seek him, he hears us and delivers us from all our fears for which we gather to praise him. And Paul's expectation that regardless of what happens, he wants to see Christ magnified in his body. Uh, I looked at this little thing about uh, like a telescope uh, it makes something that's really big, uh, bring, it brings it, but it appears small, but you can make it appear bigger in your eyes. Uh, and that's what we want to do with God. You flip it around, and it like, becomes a microscope, and it makes something, um, well, it actually makes more distance. Microscopes make small stuff big. Um, and when we basically indulge too much in pleasure, we uh, are basically making God smaller, and it, it really crowds out our understanding of God, our fruitfulness, and other things that are not really good and profitable. Um, but God did give us all things richly to enjoy. We just don't want to be addicted to it or controlled by it or forget about who gave it to us and why they gave it to us. Okay. There we are. Um, the microscope illustration was from uh, John Piper, and others have used it. And uh, he was he's a big fan of uh, desiring God and Christian hedonism. And I, I spent some time last week showing how, you know, this is his quote, we glorify God by thinking uh, but right about him. Another spotty says feeling right about him. And then another spotty says being satisfied with him, his definition of Christian hedonism. And that's really in conflict with what the scriptures say, we have Jesus' calls to discipleship. Uh, when he calls us to be servants, the word is actually slave, and the slave obeyed the master, had no will of his own. He just lived for his master's will. And the relationship that God wanted with Israel and uh, really was one that was based on them being his people and not their own people. Um, and that was, he made them so that, I mean, humans, so that we would have that. As Pascal said, there's a God-shaped vacuum in every man's heart that's only filled by God. And we try to fill it with other stuff. So uh, we have a choice before us. We can exalt and enjoy things in the light, or in the dark we can partake of forbidden fruit, which gets us in a jam. So I ended, uh, we did a little bit on the brain science of how, it's the title of a book, Hooked, uh, Brain Science and How Casual Sex Affects Human Development which I heard about on Dobson's Family Talk. I, I didn't mention last week, and I often mention when I'm talking about stuff like that, um, I kind of first came across uh, habits and how they affect our brain. And they trained monkeys to do a particular task, and they trained another group of monkeys to do a different task, and then they sacrificed the monkeys and they examined what was going on in their brain, and they found that there were ruts in their brains. Um, depending on where, what tests they were trained. And that's because our brains are electrochemical mechanisms. Uh, there's chemicals in there that produce electricity, and electricity runs across the path of least resistance. That's why they have lightning rods. They could take the lightning down to the ground rather than have it burn up your building. Uh, similarly with us, uh, we develop habits, and uh, we it's really hard to break them because it takes extra effort. Um, we spend so much time building up a bad habit, we're going to have to take even more time taking it apart and developing new habits. And one of the things you do, the sermon on this called Ain't Gonna Rain No More, is you have to stop, like just like Romans 12 tells you, doing what's wrong. Then you need to be, so you put up a barrier, uh, whatever barriers you need. And we're going to talk about some of those uh, look at maladaptive thinking um, and then you need to develop the new ones and it takes a lot more effort you need usually accountability um, 
you're going to see an example of how you can do this by yourself coming up later. But uh, we, if you go back, going into this backsliding, you're, you're busting your, the, the barriers that you put in your brain, and you got to put more work to getting back on track. So uh, according to the uh, University of Pennsylvania, the only thing that can break this cycle. So the, what's the cycle? We talked about how dopamine is a chemical that makes you feel good. Um, you have other ones in there like serotonin, uh, norepinephrine, and um, oxytocin. By the way, you can get oxytocin from petting a pet. So that's why <laughs> some of them are so, people are very, very devoted to their pets because they're meeting a need in their life. But um, dopamine, I showed you this charts on the previous one, or graphs, uh, is an addiction. Uh, you get addicted to it. And um, if you do drugs that have a you know, higher um, uh, dopamine hit than uh, you can get naturally, uh, you, you have a rebound effect and you get um, oh, like more depressed and you know more dopamine depleted because you have brain chemicals that come in to dissolve the excess dopamine and then it takes more dopamine to get the same high and that's how an addiction happens and you can be addicted to a whole lot more than drugs and we're going to look today about the addiction to uh, maladaptive thinking but uh, the University of Pennsylvania, the guy who's writing it is actually looking for, I think, clients. But he says, you know, his word, the only way it breaks the cycle of addiction is treatment. And uh, a recent study with the PET scan showed that the uh, amygdala, amygdala lights up with dopamine when a person's doing spiritual meditation. Uh, it also lights up when you know, you're experiencing something fun. Uh, Spiritual meditation is basically prayer uh, and uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, you know, they have Sexaholics Anonymous, uh, what's it, Narcotics Anonymous. Uh, these 12 step programs have known for years that spirituality or some form of contemplative meditation is an important part of the treatment. What they leave out is one of the first things you have to acknowledge is that you don't have control over the thing and you need help, and you need some higher power. The secular people are basically, they don't want to say it in this way, you need God to live a functional life. Um, so, um, it's nice to see that science, remember I looked at Revelation, Reason, and Reality, well, reality is the real science part, validate uh, the 12-step methods, and spirituality. And the hope thing is, <coughs> You can actually rebuild the uh, upregulation of uh, that, that gets destroyed by abuse uh, with one year of abstinence, and then there's some other nice chemicals that can help you do it, which I talked about last week. Okay, so we ended with some hints from Harvard. Uh, their medical school has a newsletter. <coughs> Uh, how to recognize and tame your cognitive distortions. You can actually look at what they have to say about it. Uh, mindfulness and being present in the moment. We're going to see that again in uh, maladaptive thinking. Gaging in healthy ex uh, habits like exercise, good nutrition, sun, and ideally sleep. And a biggie, this is like the Bible commands us, connection with others, open and honest communication. Uh, confess your sins to one another, you may be you know, healed. Uh, empathy, self-empathy. We're going to look at self-empathy as well in the illustration I've got for you. And one that they didn't really mention, but you s I saw it in other things, is focus on gratitude uh, for what God's given you, what's going well in your life, and, and for those around you. Uh, but Bible says, you know, basically the song says, count your blessings. Uh, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget any of his benefits. I think that's Psalm 103. So if we're focused on gratitude, it can overcome... Uh, lots of things, uh, anxiety and depression among them, if you can just keep the focus going and do the other stuff. But uh, we'll get into that when I show it in this person's life. Okay. 
So uh, I threw gambling in here. This was a maladaptive daydreaming, anxiety, and cognitive distortions. And um, that they're all related. Escapism fits in there as well. Um, so dopamine plays a key role in movement, your body's ability to move. Uh, it affects motivation. Here's the biggie, perception of reality. That's what we're going to talk about. But also the ability to experience pleasure. So a meth person has burned out their receptors and they can feel no pleasure. Just, I mean, if you think they kind of got into it seeking pleasure and a high and then uh, Newton's third law and God's consequences, uh, Newton's third law is an equal and opposite reaction. But God's consequence is that you don't um, go the, the wrong way without suffering the consequences. And the third or fourth part of this is we're going to talk about the just like God promise, promises joy and pleasure, he also promises uh, consequences that you really don't want. But I like this quote. This again is from Harvard's blog, How to Recognize and Tame Your Time Distortions. Um, a big part of dismantling our cognitive distortions is simply being aware of them. Satan keeps us in the dark. He deceives us. And people are just not self-reflective. Uh, we're, we're, you know, we're commanded to meditate and to think through the implications of Scripture for the applications to our lives. We're commanded to listen to God, be still and know that He is God. Uh, but we, we, we just kind of miss it because we're so tied up with the stuff of life and as a result we're unfruitful as a verse we'll see about that and then you're aware of them and you pay attention to how you're framing things to ourselves how we perceive things makes huge difference uh, and I have a whole series uh, on the toothpaste.net on perception and performance and various uh, problems that people experience in their lives uh, some of the stuff I got from Tony Ro Robbins uh, but you know, there's a lot of other stuff in there from the Bible and other sources as well. And good mental habits are as important as good physical habits. If we frame things in a healthy, positive way, we will almost, almost certainly experience less anxiety and isolation. Uh, this doesn't mean that we ignore problems or challenges or our feelings. <clears throat> It's just that we approach them <clears throat> with a can-do attitude instead of letting our thoughts and feelings amplify our anxiety. And I think next week I got some really cool, kind of fun examples of how we distort things, uh, and make things much worse for ourselves. Like, I think uh, Mark Twain talked about a person who experienced uh, a great many. Uh, pain and trials in their life, most of which never happened. Got my little ostrich here, and the head does go right down into the sand. Uh, maladaptive daydreaming, MDD. They always use acrostics. It is a psychological phenomenon characterized by extensive daydreaming that replaces real-life human interaction. We live in a fantasy world. Uh, the, the whole uh, role play games, people just immerse themselves in that. Um, the addiction to binge watching certain things where you just kind of get into the character's world uh, is overdoing you know, the normal break from thinking about it. So when I watch a movie, um, I find myself actually immersed in the action and if somebody will talk to me during it, it just kind of breaks the spell. <laughs> but while I'm watching it, um, the other stuff that uh, maybe I was obsessing a little bit about uh, goes away so that when I finish uh, watching an engrossing thing, um, I, I'm, real, I'm not uh, anxious or I'm much more calm uh, because uh, I have given the re those nerve receptors a break. Uh, but they can also hamper an individual's functioning in important areas such as school or work. So people say, ostriches don't stick their heads in the sand. All right, that's not correct. Ostriches do stick their heads in the sand. 
not when they're scared, but they're normally checking on their eggs. All right. <laughs> um, when ostriches are scared and they can't run away, uh, they will, according to Cleveland Zoo, will flop to the ground and try to blend in. So hopefully it won't be noticed, which <laughs> sometimes are defense mechanisms as well. <laughs> However, if you corner them or they're young, uh, they will fight and they kill people. Now, they don't normally kill people. In fact, they actually like people. A uh, cute little fact is that when um, ostriches have a lot of human contact as they're growing up, they become more attached to the humans than to other ostriches. And they actually try to mate with the humans. They view them as their... Uh, <laughs> they have bird, you know. <laughs> so... But we have people who do uh, figuratively stick their head in the sand. <coughs> they don't want to know what the problem is. They're hiding from reality. And the thing is, what they're doing is putting those ruts deeper and deeper into their brain. And uh, it just makes the problems worse. In fact, we're going to look at, let me see what I have down here. Okay, well... Uh, this maladaptive daydreaming uh, involves vivid and immersive fantasy worlds that a person creates within their minds, often to cope, I would put escape, with stress, anxiety, and other emotional challenges. Uh, prayer is probably a better response, oh God help, but if you just dive into something else, you're not you're cutting yourself off from God's help. Uh, many individuals with uh, maladaptive daydreaming have a history of childhood trauma, abuse, or emotional distress. Um, yeah, there are people who d disassociate themselves from their trauma and they bury it, and then often it has to be uncovered with some therapy uh, to make, help them able to be function better. <clears throat> as well as certain traits such as high creativity and absorption can predispose individuals to engage in it. So the way you're wired can make you more susceptible to this. <clears throat> but it's not a healthy response to life and uh, something that in Christ you can be set free from it. How do I know if you have MDD? <laughs> How do you know if you have MDD? Uh, think about what you spend most of your time thinking about. Uh, and are you neglecting like your spiritual disciplines? Do you go to your... It's like, does the alcoholic go to God or they go to their bottle? Um, or if you're spending lots of time fantasizing a life for yourself um, because you can't accept the life that you've got uh, or you, you have trouble with self-acceptance and you uh, <clears throat> basically uh, adopt this other persona. So now you can actually do that online and pretend you're something that you're not. But before they had uh, all the, this online stuff, uh, people would spend all their time daydreaming about being another person. Uh, if you're wrestling with uh, self-image and acceptance, uh, Bill Gothard's basic seminar, it's free. You just Google that. Uh, one of the first things he does is talk about recognizing God's creation of you and your ownership, his ownership of you. Uh, in fact, in uh, my you know, last decades, I've I find myself repeatedly going back to the fact that God is our creator. We are not self-created beings, and everything really flows from that. <clears throat> and failing <clears throat> to recognize who he is and who we are as a result causes all kinds of problems in people's lives. <clears throat> okay, so this article, it's, uh, I give you the psych something or other, P-S-Y-C-H-E, uh, on the end. <clears throat> It's written by a uh, Nigerian uh, law student, a female, that had some issues as she was growing up. And uh, she really nailed the, the, what this problem is and also how she by herself got out of it. And then she gives some uh, you know, steps that you can take uh, and this will, this will work for almost everything. It's not just daydreaming. If, if your thinking is because of your lack of 
dopamine and bad perception of things. You have bad perception from a lot because your sources of influence are not uh, the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> uh, you are going to have problems. So she said, what, why should I return to a world filled with struggle and stress when I could exist in my vivid daydreams? This imaginary world initially offered immense relief from real life problems. It's a coping mechanism. However, in disrupting my waking activities, it would eventually begin to compound the emotional stress. And she got to the point where she wasn't doing her schoolwork, she was losing her scholar, she lost her scholarship. Uh, and so the people who were trying to help her, uh, she just, you know, had to rebuild a lot of destruction that she did, self inflicted as the woman's part. She said, my daydreams weren't just harmful flights of fantasy. In other words, they're harmful. Most of the times I would rehearse the same scenes over and over again in a corner of the room. Think of the monkeys, okay? Over and over again, when you put something in your mind, the way you can get yourself to do things is to mentally rehearse it. You practice within when you're without. It's one of the principles from Covey uh, and Earl Nightingale and all the guys who talked about how to uh, achieve success in your brain first. Um, she would slightly tweak the conversations or facial expressions. I would cry when my characters cried. Whoa. And I would laugh when they did. Although I would compulsively pace around while daydreaming, I tried my best to mask it as much as I could be kind, a facade of unassuming behavior. So she hid it hid from reality. An ostrich. Daydreaming became my constant refuge, a way to leave my body and numb the pain. So one of the counseling techniques of, of people who have experienced you know, real trauma um, is to have, have them draw a frame around it and step out of that frame, look back at themselves in that frame and realize that, that you know, they are the person standing outside, not the person in the frame. Um, but I think the scriptures kind of give us another fortress and refuge and help in days of times of trouble. It's God. So, you know, that, um, he actually can give you grace to numb the pain. Um, I battled guilt because somehow she still knew that that wasn't the right thing to be doing. Shame. Yeah. You know, the guilt fits. Wear it and frustration every time I succumb to hours of daydreaming. Yet in those daydreamings, an idealized version of myself was able to experience love, acceptance, and wholeness. Okay, where'd she get the desires for those things? They're innate. God designed us to experience love, his love. Even if everyone else around us hates us, he can love us. Acceptance, he will accept us if we are doing his will. Well done, good, you know, faithful servant. Uh, and wholeness, God made us to be fulfilled by him, and she wants that stuff, but she was getting it through her daydreams. I have to wait to the end to see what she did. She has not become a Christian. I attempted to go cold turkey, vowing to quit altogether. You ever make a promise? God, get me out of this. I'll never do this again. Yeah, right, that lasts a week, a day. But even the sounds of music, not the musical, could trigger episodes that spiraled into hours of immersive escape. Okay, there, she mentioned escape. And I'd offer, berate myself, desperately pleading with God to fix my brain. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> it's funny, uh, the other day I was making dinner and uh, I put on, uh, I had Amanda play uh, Jefferson Airplane and uh, the songs came back and I actually got transported to the concert that I went to <laughs> um, in my college days uh, with, with them. <laughs> so uh, be careful little ears what you hear, and be careful little eyes what you see. But uh, this spiral, uh, this is particularly true of people with Myers-Briggs personality tendency of being a more subjective person than objective and it just it, it, you, know, you know how a spiral is you just keep going down and down and your world gets smaller and smaller as you go down the drain 
and the time you get out of the spiral is as soon as you recognize you're going around the, the toilet the first time. Um, so as uh, she transitioned to adulthood, uh, maladaptive daydreaming began to per exert a pervasive influence interfering with my social in interactions and academic pursuits. Instead of engaging with my real friends, I preferred to retreat into fantasy, Howard. Even basic tasks like cooking, cleaning, and personal hygiene became daunting challenges. Wow. However, by drawing her attention, okay, so this is an act of the will. She's recognized that it is really bad and harming her. She started drawing her attention focusing on the here and now and gain greater control over her daydreaming tendencies. I had to learn to manage my condition without professional help and in silence. That because in Nigeria, if you basically say you have a mental problem, they really you know, kind of isolate you and yeah, it's really bad. It wasn't easy and the journey has been filled with setbacks and moments of despair. And we're not saying this is easy. God's grace is sufficient for all our need. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. But one of the first things she did is sought support. I used to think I was the only one dealing with it, but a few years ago I discovered an online community of individuals from around the world who shared my struggle with maladaptive daydreaming. It was a sanctuary. When, when a person is threatened, they don't change. They're too busy building defensive walls or running. It's a sanctuary where I could finally speak openly about my challenges without fear of judgment or misunderstanding. So uh, I've seen a number of movies and programs, but not personally experienced a person who's in an AA meeting or whatever, and uh, they share their story. Uh, they say, you know, I, I am Bill, I'm an alcoholic, and uh, everyone says, hi, Bill. <laughs> and they're getting some acceptance. So they're going, <gasps> um, So if we are seeking to minister to people and helping them mature in Christ, uh, we have to understand this need for feeling um, safe, um, fear of judgment or misunderstanding, which means we need to understand why things are what they are and go through the process of uh, you know, instructing, admi encouraging, admonishing before we get deeper into reproof, bringing to light. And then if a person doesn't want the light and they want to walk in the dark, uh, rebuking them. <clears throat> but in this support group, she online, I encountered others who understood the profound grip of this problem. Yeah, it's kind of really insensitive. If we don't have a problem with something and someone else does it, oh, yeah, well, what's the problem? <laughs> um, and, and, and we do that, you know, it's not really spirit motivated. It, um, we do that because it makes us feel better than some perverse uh, subconscious level. Uh, she was around people who didn't ask, why don't you just stop? But rather offered empathy, support, and practical advice. Uh, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And for certain personality types, empathy is a big deal. Um, gals do empathy a whole lot easier. Uh, I read something I couldn't actually validate the source, but I, uh, they might have more um, serotonin than guys. I think that's the way it works. And uh, they're able to kind of share in others' pain better. Guys have less, so they don't want the pain that when they're hearing about it, so they just want to fix it and stop the pain that's going on in them. Um, Empathy uh, has the same pathos. So you, it, it gives sensitivity, support, wanting to help, and then practical advice. This is where guys come in pretty strong. Uh, often people who are big on empathy just talk out of their experience uh, and it is not necessarily the right thing. Uh, I also opened up for the first time to my close friend 
So now I don't feel alone anymore. When we sin, we are hiding in the dark. And it's God kind of designed it so we would feel guilty, shame, and alone. And the design is to get back, you know, with the with the program. Uh, but loneliness is a huge, huge problem. Uh, I can't remember where it fits on the range of uh, causes of suicide. Um, it's much more prevalent among older men because they don't, you know, have the empathy support kind of thing. Uh, reduced feelings of isolation have lessened the need to resort to maladaptive uh, daydreaming. So being part of a body is God's design for people to experience these things. You know, the goal is of uh, is love is not to accept the behavior, accept the person, you want to help the person, but when they are engaging in self-destructive behavior and they don't see it as self-destructive, you know, selfishness is self-destructive. It's also eternally destructive, but they don't see it. And uh, God's designed isolation to help people, uh, and some just get too stuck in it. Staying present. So this is mindfulness, this whole mindfulness thing, uh, which uh, when I first kind of looked at it, I thought, this is years ago. That, that's just being mindless. <laughs> well, it's mindless of the things that are bothering you and mindful of your breath, <laughs> the way you feel yourself sitting in a chair. Um, so one of the early techniques she learned or adopted was staying present. Uh, she would put her hand on her chest to feel her heartbeat or count the num leaves on a branch nearby to keep my focus on the moment and take her focus off the thing that was eating at her or loneliness, or rejection, or pain. By drawing attention to the here and now, I gain greater control over my daydreaming tendencies. Fortunately, she recognizes it now as a tendency. Yeah, it's not a, a, you know, it's something that's enslaved you, and you can call it a tendency. Uh, drawing attention to the here and now made her more conscious of the triggers uh, early mornings. So I'm not, like, if you wake up, and the first thing you want to do is do daydreaming. I think <laughs> you're, you're really in bed. Maybe she was just talking about that you know, in early mornings before she woke up. Soap operas. I know a couple people, Ivy League educated, who are hooked on soap operas. I know other people <laughs> that are college educated hooked on soap operas. Um, they're, they're living a vicarious life. Um, are they dissatisfied with their life? I have, like, probably the, in my life I've tried looking at soap operas to figure out just what's going on five times, and I've wasted five minutes on it overall. It's just like, what in the world is, you know, wh why would anybody like this? Um... <laughs> Intense conversations. <gasps> oh no, I've got to talk. Conflicts with relatives. Well, yeah, you, know, you all know the difference between in-laws and outlaws. Outlaws are wanted. All right. So you know, there's always conflicts in family. Uh, there's a psychiatrist that I used to play tennis with who lived across the street from me when I, when I was uh, in high school. And he said uh, the problem. He uh, taught at Sloan Kettering. And had a practice there. He said, uh, "Is family demons," and I, I do see, as I've read more and understood more, that the the the, the, the same. I, I guess the best nicest term is demonically influenced behaviors that I have seen in family groups, uh, gets passed on from one generation to the next. The other thing I triggered uh, off this is repetitive tasks. <clears throat> um, so she gained more conscious of the triggers, along with the sensations I experienced in my day, during my daydream episodes. So she's conscious of the triggers in that. I'm not sure. It's a little unclear. Physical activities helped. Step three. Engaging in physical activities that demanded my full attention helped me divert my mind from daydreaming. As I spent 
more time getting active out in the world, I also minimized my use of social media, which had tended to heighten feelings of inadequacy while providing fodder for daydreaming. I started to notice less compulsive daydreaming when my social apps were deactivated. Okay, this is in Nigeria. I'm not sure how many years ago this was written. It could just have been written here in New York. Yeah, it's like this is... Um, social media is... Uh, really detrimental uh, to people's uh, development and mental health. In fact, I think a, a governor of New York proposed legislation to uh, require uh, online providers of information to give it in chronological order rather than according to the algorithms to keep people from getting hooked by it because they have developed algorithms to get you hooked. And uh, it's going to get challenged by the ACLU, be free speech or something like that. But uh, it's a big mental health problem. Then creating time boundaries. She realized early on that she needed to set up boundaries between her daydreaming and my daily life. So how do I tame this beast? Um, if you understand what causes it, then you want to build up things in your life around your temptation as you pray, uh, leave me not in temptation, but deliver me from evil. Words of prayer. So for her, setting specific times for activities allowed her to maintain a degree of control over her compulsions. Remember, compulsion and control, you know, so she's controlling rather than the compulsion controlling her. She would set alarms and reminders with labels like study five pages of constitutional law textbook or text to me and Sarah. Over time, she managed to reduce the frequency and duration of her daydreaming episodes by setting up these time barriers. So this little bold-faced stuff in the middle here is, if you by the Spirit put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. The Spirit's at work in you to will and to do God's good pleasure. I remember reading this way back when, I think it was in the Amplified Version, if you habitually make extinct... That means every time the whack-a-mole shows up, you whack it on the head. Uh, and you make them as extinct as dinosaurs. You, every time, you don't let it run its course and take over you. Uh, you kill it as, it's, as soon as it starts. And the Spirit of God will give you the grace to do that. If you buy the Spirit, do it. Well, how do you get the Spirit to help you do that? Study, read memorize, meditate on the first 13 verses of Romans. The mind that's set on the flesh is death. The mind that's set on the spirit is life and peace. Okay, what am I setting my mind on? If I'm setting it on the flesh, I'm killing myself spiritually and could even be doing it physically. The mind that's spent on the spirit gets me, the, reaps me the blessings of life and peace in this age and in the age to come. Okay, similarly, cognitive behavioral therapy helps. So, What's cognitive behavioral therapy? Good old AI comes up with. Helps people become aware of the negative or inaccurate thinking so they can respond to challenges, situations more effectively. The goal is to replace unhelpful thoughts with more realistic and encouraging ones. Transformation. Romans 12, 1 and 2. The motivation is in one. God's got, you know, he... Uh, this extended mercy to you. Uh, he calls you to serve him. Two, stop doing the stuff that's not pleasing to God. Instead, be metamorphosized by the renewing of your mind, and then you can get the good, acceptable, and pleasing will of God. Um, so, I remember when I had my counseling courses with Minworth and Meyer, uh, chiefs of psychiatry at... Uh, Richardson General Hospital, and uh, they ran the department. They also ran the counseling department at Dallas Seminary. Uh, I remember thinking uh, when I heard this, oh, that's simple. Uh, if a person was, you know, once they understood what was going on, they'd give them a little notebook and say, okay, every time you, you get these thoughts, write down what you're doing, what it is. And then bring them in and they would talk, they would talk with the person. And show them how that was leading to a negative consequence that they didn't want. And then help them replace it with 
helpful ones. It's, you know, uh, it's not rocket science. Uh, but I think for s somehow we have lost the ability to, the, the awareness of ourself, to be able to change ourselves. Um, so God provided the body for uh, that, that solution. Um, and, you know, I regularly listen to uh, other sermons and podcasts just so I'm not deceiving myself about who I am and what I'm doing. Creating time bar barriers. Self-compassion. Hmm. These kind of things always get me nervous because... <laughs> Um, perhaps the most challenging and transformative lesson was learning to be kind to myself. I had to adapt, accept that my maladaptive daydreaming was not a character flaw. Huh? I, I think it is. And that nothing was fundamentally wrong with my brain. No, except you damaged your brain, so actually there was. Uh, so, um, but, uh, yeah, people who have problems, usually it's because of other people. And the first things you have to work with them in is forgiving the other people so they're not bound by Satan because that's lack of forgiveness, bitterness is a red flag for Satan to take over your life. You'll say that he, he, he doesn't do it personally. He has lots of demons that do it. He can send a very junior your demon to take over a bitter person who will then help you twist it, anything, the thing or situation or person you're bitter at as being something that's a personal affront. Um, the... Next thing you have to work on forgiving <clears throat> usually is God, because God let this happen. We blame God for our problems. It doesn't really affect him because he's a big guy. He can take it, <clears throat> and he knows it's not true. But then ourselves, uh, people have trouble forgiving themselves. Uh, you know, we, we kick ourselves. Every time the thought comes up, we say, oh, what a fool. Well, yeah, it was true. All right. <laughs> but that's not me anymore. So, treating my, you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself, which means you do have to love yourself. I think people go overboard on this. Uh, you sacrifice yourself to love others. But treating myself with compassion allowed me to gradually reduce the grip. Remember, habitually make extinct. And you do that by never yielding an inch of the old behavior or thinking. So, gradually reduce the grip that daydreaming had on my life. God doesn't want daydreaming, poor thinking, any of the bad habits to be uh, ruling our lives. So he's at work in us to willing to do his good pleasure. Um, if that's the case, why do we have so much trouble? Why do we resist him? I think that comes up on the next screen or two. Definitely next time. Um, so breaking free from maladaptive daydreaming was an ongoing, or is an ongoing process for me. She says, there's still days I slip, but I try to accept that without judging or criticizing myself. Okay, this is where self-compassion is really good. If you make a mistake, it's okay. The righteous person falls seven times, but gets back up and keeps going. You don't go, oh, it's hopeless, you know, uh, because as long as you're still breathing, there's hope. Um, let's see. Yeah, without judging or criticizing yourself. I'm not as overwhelmed as I used to be. Um, and then she, her, she concludes that others in Nigeria who long for a life less consumed by escapes into fantasy, her hope is that they will find the support and understanding that they need. So there it is, psyche.com. Um, and she make her feel trapped in her own mind. But she broke free. And sh she did this without having to go into treatment but you did have support. Okay, yeah, I've got the next verse. Fine. So now we're going to enter into the biblical perspective, which is always good because uh, here's the biblical perspective. God has designed us to know and do what's beneficial and supplies the power and motivation to do what's good in his sight and also in our sight. Okay, let's take a look at this little word beneficial. It benefits us. It benefits God. It benefits others. And we have to know it and do it. The, the definition of godliness in the pagan religions was used of the priests who knew and did what the gods wanted. 
somehow, either through tradition or whatever, they you know figured out how, what kind of offerings the gods were supposed to get, and then they performed them. God's designed us to be his priests, and he wants us to know and do what's beneficial. How do we know? Well, his spirit's wanting to guide us, but he does it through his word. He can also do it directly, but he is the spirit of truth, and he guides us in all truth, so let's use the word because that's very accessible and very objective. God provides the motivation and the power to do what's good in his and our sight, because once we are doing it, we realize this is what's best for me, the, that you might experience the good, acceptable, and pleasing will of God, Romans 12, 2. So, well, Philippians 3, we actually sung this this morning. Um, someone wrote, her body wrote a song for it. It is God who works in you. He's at work. And what, what, what work is he doing? He is giving you the will, or better word would be desire. It's the same word. To do, and the ability, two things, and the ability to do, desire and do his good pleasure. If we're doing his good pleasure, we experience his good pleasure. We experience worth and value. We have a basis for self-esteem. We have an open channel of communication with him. He guides us, this, all this great stuff. If we want to do our good pleasure, we're just losers. So, so if God's at work in us, why do we resist him? Demonic influence. Stephen uh, getting martyred uh, in Acts says, you, I think it's 549 or somewhere in there. It says, you always resist the Holy Spirit as did your forefathers in the nation of Israel. Why would we resist the God who wants to guide us into the purposes for which he made us? Kind of goes back to the story of Job or the account of Job. Satan doesn't want us to serve and please and glorify God because God will give us the glory that Satan wanted and lost. Thank you. <clears throat> so Satan is at work in our culture, through our culture, and also directly and through family demons to influence our desires and actions that destroy our temporal and our eternal well-being and pleasure. The thief, this is Jesus in contrast to him, does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what Satan does. He's robbing you of your glory. He blinds you to it. I have come that they might have life and that it may have it more abundantly. At the end, John 20. He says, these things are written that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That's what it's about. And then Jesus underscores how he uh, does that. I am the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. Okay, why do we resist the Holy Spirit? Because we're more open to Satan than we are to the Holy Spirit or to God. And we have values that are come out of our culture um, as well as Satan's direct involvement in our lives. <clears throat> you, God made alive. You who were dead because of your trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2 tells us. Okay, we're enemies with God. We were deprived of dominion. We had no power. And it's not original sin going on here. It's plural trespasses and plural sins. It's not total depravity. If you think there's total depravity, take a look at Calvinism for dummies. Totally, um, forget, I put, put that in the title of, well, I did five sermons on the five points. Now, in your trespasses and sins, you're stepping over the line. That's what a trespass is. You violated a clear command. And a sin is you missed the mark, and you did it repeatedly. In these, you also lived according to the course of this world. That's our culture. Satan runs this our culture. We do not have a Christian culture. 
in this country and in most of the world there is no such thing. Also, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan. He is the spirit who now works in the Jews, the sons of disobedience. So he sets up the world system. We float downstream with all the other floatsome. And uh, we just go right along and miss our destination of the salvation God has in store for us. And anybody who starts trying to swim upstream, he directly intervenes and tempts you. I saw repeatedly when we were trying to minister to college students how a person uh, who didn't have a boyfriend or girlfriend would accept Christ, and then within a week, God brought, I mean, not God, Satan brought a boyfriend or girlfriend into their life to sidetrack them. Oh, so if I want a date, I should. <laughs> All right. Yeah, become a Christian. It's good. <laughs> now, among the Jews, we also once conducted ourselves. So, you know, basically, it, the Jews and Gentiles are not getting along. Uh, God's trying to get them to get along, and Satan's create unity, and Satan's trying to uh, disrupt that unity. Ephesians 6, read all about it in Daily Truth Base. Uh, but the way we conducted our lives pre-Christ is in the lust of our flesh. Desires for the temporal. Desires for the flesh is the temporal stuff. Fulfilling, so we're, you know, basically wrote our score and now we're playing it to fulfill our desires of the flesh and also of the mind. There's a huge number of people who sit in church pews who say, oh, I would never indulge in the flesh like those pagans do. Yet their mind is just as carnal as carnal means flesh as uh, the pagans, if not more so. And we were, by nature, naturally is better translation, children of wrath, just as the others. So God is going to reveal his wrath against people who suppress the truth. Romans 1, that's about believers who suppress the truth. Just like he's, um, the Jews who were rejecting the Messiah uh, paid consequences for that. Oh, I'm pleased already. Wait, really? Did I miss that point? Let's see if I. No. Not sure how many fingers. Oh, come on, my fingers aren't working. Let's go back one. Do I have any more in here? All right, now we get to look at some words. So, when I first started doing the subject of pleasure, I wanted to understand what these words were. I do this in almost everything I study. And, not almost everything, on everything I study. <laughs> And almost every verse I go through on here, I actually go through and think, okay, is that the right translation? What is, do I really understand what that word means? And I'll, I'll look it up and look how it's used. And you know, I, I want to make sure that I'm accurately reflecting what God wrote because I'm not a first century Greek speaker like the original audience. So uh, the word for pleased, uh, this is from Vines. It, it's, it's, it's written in English, believe it or not. Uh, it's free. It's actually a free app you can get on it. Um, I have it in the bi online Bible program. And it gives you Strong's number. So you can actually look up all the usages of this word. It's udekeo. It means to be well pleased. Okay, you, like eulogy, is to speak well of someone, is well or good. And dokeo means to think, to judge, to account, or determine. Up here, it's to be of a reasoned opinion, to seem good to you. We do things that seem good to us. Unfortunately, it's not always good for us because our opinion is not properly reasoned. But the you know, Greek play Bynes is quoting other Greek uh, lexicons, not merely in understanding what is right and good, <coughs> but stressing the willingness and freedom of an intentional resolve regarding what's good. Now, unfortunately, these lexicographers put together things with words that we have to kind of spend some time unraveling. But this endokeo means I'm willing and able 
and I intend, yay, I resolve to do what is good. I know what's good, and I'm determined to do it. I'm pleased. So, two examples, one uh, of the deity and one of us mere humans. Um, <coughs> this is Luke 12. Luke 12 is a uh, Jesus' teaching similar to the Sermon on the Mount of uh, seeking first his kingdom, not being anxious, uh, not running after things that all the pagans run after, which is one of the things that keeps us from uh, real pleasure. Don't fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God's plan for us to be sharing in the kingdom and ruling and reigning with Christ and enjoying the banquets and the wedding feast of the Lamb and all that other good stuff is something he determined to do and it's the right thing to do and he's going to do it. So he wants to give us this. It's not like with all the, oh gee, I only got 16 billion invitations and I got, you know, 12 billion, you know, 20 billion people. What am I going to do? Um, no, there's plenty of room to give the blessings to all. This is, it's more like I've got all these blessings to give out, but nobody's claiming them and they're not eligible. And then Romans 15, um, the saints in Ikea, Asia, wherever that is, um, it pleased them to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who were in Jerusalem. So they judged, considered it's a good thing to support the saints who were in Jerusalem because they were the ones that um, were being most persecuted and they are the ones that uh, basically are responsible for the gospel getting out to them. So they said, it's a good thing to do it. They, and uh, they eventually did. So you see this word, there's, you consider it a good thing. You thought through it. You have a set of values that um, tell you what's right or wrong. You have the spirit to help you. Uh, you're immersed in Proverbs and you, you kind of know this is good, that's bad. Now, there's another word for pleasure, and this is called hedone. This is where we get our hedonism. Um, this is from the NID NTT, New International Dictionary of New Testament Theology. Uh, when this, before this came out, I used this 10 volume set, which I still have, but unfortunately they're, they're scattered all over the house. Um, this is a three volume set. So it was done based off the New International Version. Um, it builds on the work and condenses the work uh, of uh, Kittle, TDNTA, that's abridged version that I sometimes copy for you in here. And uh, it started out with a, e each of the volumes is, almost, is about a thousand pages. Uh, it's about this thick for volume one. Volume two is this thick. Volume three is that thick <laughs> because they've been putting all these indexes in it. And uh, yeah, I think I didn't count how many pages are in the second volume, but it could be you know, close to the 2000 mark. Um, so they do things where they give you classical meanings of from where we get our word hedonism and it ha it's used positively as being pleasant to the taste and then it was pleasant to the senses and it can also be used negatively so Aristotle and the Stoics will look at first so they tell you how it's used in classical literature Aristotle considered it a synonym of joy synonym or is it not make not cinnamon <laughs> of joy in expressing pleasure in practicing the virtues that's a rete now here's a thought that probably doesn't enter into people's minds expressing pleasure in practicing the virtues that was their highest good and for the ascetic pleasure in works of art now, when we think of ancient people practicing virtues, we think it's like some big struggle and they're beating themselves or, you know, whatever. But actually, it, the, knowing that you're doing what is right and that you are a person of worth and value gave the person joy. Now, the Stoics, who arose a little later, uh, referred to it as unrestrained passion. So he, that's where we get our current use of hedonism. 
They said, referring to sex, that's unrestrained passion. It meant in man's involvement in his material surroundings. Okay, now, pay attention to this. We are very much involved in our material surroundings. Our clothing, our food, our housing, our work, our car, all that stuff. And the Stoics recognize that that holds down the soul in trying to mount up to God. That could be written of Christians. Our involvement in the material surroundings without having the Spirit's influence to guide and protect us holds us down in trying to become partakers of the divine nature. And then a little later on in your definition, they, they had, the Stoics said, one ruled by Hirone had missed the purpose of life. Wow. How many people in our culture, in your circle of acquaintances, have missed the purpose of life? The vast majority. They're not living for God's glory and to enjoy Him forever. They're living for a little bit dopamine hit here and now. Right, you can be obsessed with the project that you're involved in because it, you, it does give you a dopamine hit. Accomplishment gives you a dopamine hit. You know, the neuroscience says that. And then you even have to say, open up your brain to see that. <laughs> they can just do it with brain scans now. But they miss the purpose of life. And you know, people are going to show up at the judgment seat of Christ. And God's going to say, okay, how did you fulfill the purpose for which I created you? And they'll go, What? <laughs> Wow. Okay, so then they go back and they use this LXX as a Septuagint. It's the, it's the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And uh, it's about 250 years before Christ. And uh, they'll give you how it's used in the Old Testament. I have a concordance, which I don't use very well, of Greek words in the Old Testament. So I, you can actually have this other tre treasure trove of how things are used. Sometimes Thayer's lexicon, which you have most online versions, We'll give you a couple of Old Testament passages, and then you can you know, piece, parse it together from there. Okay, Philo uh, is a writer. Uh, he also invented the dough. No, he didn't. <laughs> Philo dough is used for, you know, baklava. Um, though he might have, you know, it was Greek, uh, but he's a Jewish guy. Called this hedonism a revolt against Logos. Lagos. Reason. It's a revolt against reason. This, thus, the root of all evil impulses, the desire for the temporal, can only bring ponos, which is trouble, evil, and pain. Then the rabbis talked about this, and they said, hedonism makes a man reluctant to study the Torah. Yeah, they don't want to hear what God wants to say, because, you know, so as I told you, a friend had given me a Bible and wrote in it, but someone had written his Bible, said this book will keep you from sin, and sin will keep you from this book. And that is the reason why most people do not um, you know, spend, have a part of their morning routine of meditation in the scriptures. You don't have to use, do a Bible, you can use an app. Okay, then there's the New Testament usages of it. So here's where they get more theological, and this usually isn't as, I don't get as much out of that, but they do have, Building on this article, the New Testament usage of Hidene, desire for pleasure, which fills, I put in controls, the man estranged from God. If you don't have God controlling you, who's going to be trolling, who's controlling you? Your desires. Where do your desires come from? Satan and his world. Ephesians 2. The person estranged from God thinks they're living out their own irresistible desire for pleasure, like you, Hefner. But in doing so, you revolt against God and his will. And in fact, you're seeking that pleasure, you become a slave of it. Faith dies choked among the thorns. 
person's estranged from God, they're not exercising faith. God's not pleased with them. They're reaping negative consequences. They're not being fruitful. They've missed the purpose of life. For what? Something subject to the law of diminishing returns that they wind up feeling guilty about? The drive to self-expression. We're looking at you, modern psychologists. The sinister power of instincts expressed in slaves can only be conquered by the power of God. I gotta be me. Sammy Davis Jr. sang. He was alive. Other people have as well. Self-expression. Yeah, that's we're supposed to express Christ likeness, not ourself, because herself isn't really too cool. Low diminishing returns, right here, folks. And I think I might end with this. World's richest, wisest man. According to the scriptures, no one has been like him ever since. Observe, he who loves silver or gold or precious stones will not be satisfied with silver or gold or precious stones. Nor the one who loves abundance with increase. This is also vanity, purposelessness, grasping at the wind, emptiness. So those are the two words that we got, and pick it up on this next time. True and lasting, i.e. eternal source of pleasure is trusting God for the eternal pleasures, or no, trusting the God of the eternal pleasures. He richly gives us all things to enjoy, but just take a quick peek at Psalm 16. The sorrows will be multiplied who hasten after another God. But God will show those who are seeking him the path of life in his presence is fullness of joy and at his right hands are pleasures forevermore. As opposed to Edgar Allan Poe's Raven, nevermore, but forevermore. That also gets quoted in Acts, but let's pray. Uh, God, thank you for revealing yourself to be as uh, the source of not just life and light, but all the things that we like. Um, you created us with those desires and you have a plan to fulfill them. And we thank you for the times that we have seen you at work in doing that. Uh, thank you that uh, you give us your spirit to cause us to desire and do what is ultimately pleasing to ourselves, as glorifies you. Um, you want us to be happy. You want us to be pleased. You want us to be grateful and thankful and acknowledge you. Uh, not just because you're an egomaniac, but because you want to keep us from looking to other wells for our satisfaction of our thirsts. So we thank you for your truth. Uh, we thank you for the uh, psychological, neurobiological research that uh, supports it. And uh, we thank you for the example of this uh, Nigerian gal who um, recognized, um, maybe by your spirit, uh, that uh, she could change, and she did. So, Lord, uh, we pray that you continue your work in us to cause us to desire and do what pleases you. Thank you for this time and your word, Christ's name. Amen.